Hi everyone, welcome back to 348. So in this video we're going to talk about a very special type of function called a predicate. So what we're going to do is we're going to let a be a non-empty set, like it is in any function. We'll say that a predicate p is a function that takes inputs from that from this non-empty set a and sends it out to what we call the Boolean space where this Boolean space is just the set containing true or false. So really what we're saying is that a predicate is something that takes in some sort of input and gives us out a statement that is either true or false. What this means is that a predicate outputs a proposition. Another way we can think of a predicate is as a open statement whose truth value is dependent on a variable subject. So let's take, for example, the predicate p from the integers to our Boolean space here. And we're going to define it as p of x is equal to the statement x plus 13 equals 5. Now we've talked about the statement before and we talked about the reason why this by itself isn't a proposition is because we don't know x's value. So the idea with a predicate is that we're going to be able to put in values for x and get out of it a statement that is either true or false. So for example, p of negative 8 is going to be equal to the statement negative 8 plus 13 equals 5. And this is equivalent to true. So the input is negative 8 and the output is true. Similarly, we can do something like p of 0 is the statement 0 plus 13 equals 5, which is equivalent to false. So if we take an input 0, then the image of that input under our predicate is false. So it's really important to note that a predicate is specifically a type of function. So when we have our statement p of x is x plus 13 equals 5, and we've defined this predicate as taking in integers and giving out a Boolean value, what we're saying is that any integer that we put in, no matter what value that integer is, will always give us true or false. And not only that, but for any integer we put in, it will either always be true or always be false. So you can't have an integer that gives us out a statement that is both true and false or neither true or neither true nor false. So this is partially due to the fact that p is specifically a function and partially due to the fact that we are outputting propositions. So predicates are going to be a really powerful and extremely helpful type of function for us to work with. But this is why Defining a predicate like this is going to be one of the more important definitions, along with the definition of a function, that we'll go over for this class. So, as with the definition for a function, I would highly recommend paying specific attention to this one. So, I have an example predicate here. This predicate takes in real numbers and gives us out propositions. And this predicate p is going to define by, be defined by p of x equals 0x times 0. So, as we can see here, p of negative 5 as it being 0 times negative 5 equals 0, which is a true proposition. P of 0 is the statement 0 times 0 equals 0, also a true proposition. And P of 3, 0 times 3 equals 0, is also true. So actually, by the properties of multiplying any real number by 0, we know that no matter what real number we pass in as input, it's always going to be true. So this proposition maps every element in the domain to a true proposition. And this idea is actually going to be really helpful for us to talk about if the idea that some predicates will bring every element of their domain to true. So we're going to talk about some tools that we can use to talk about statements like that, as well as statements that tell us whether at least one input of our domain equals true. The next thing we'll talk about is the universal quantification of P. And I realize now that I forgot to write down that P is going to be a predicate from some non-empty set A to our Boolean space or our set of true and false. 
So if we define P as such, then the universal quantification of P is going to be the statement, it is the case that P of X is true for all X in A. So the universal quantification is itself a proposition that claims that for every element of our domain, P applied to that element is true. And the way we would write that symbol symbolically is we would use this upside down A and then X. And this is for all X and then P of X. This is the statement for all X, P of X is true. You can also say something like for all X in A, P of X, if you want to do some extra specification of where X is coming from. So in this case, we're saying that for every X in A, for every X in our domain of P, P applied to X results in a true proposition. So for example, we can come back to this example right here, where P of X goes from, where P goes from the real numbers to the set of Boolean values and P of X equals zero X times zero. So because we know that any real number that we pass in here is going to give us a true proposition, what we can say is that the proposition for all X in the real numbers, P of X, is equivalent to true. So this whole thing here is a true proposition. We can also think of it as saying, we can also write it like this. So for all X in the real numbers, zero X equals zero is equivalent to true. So again, this whole thing is a proposition that says that no matter what element of the real numbers we plug into here, we end up with a true proposition. So now I want to come back to this other example here, the predicate that takes integers and maps them to propositions based on the statement x plus 13 equals 5. So what we have here is that we do have one element of the integers, negative 8, that brings this, that transforms this statement into a true proposition, but we have that zero here, when we plug in zero to the statement, we end up getting a false proposition. So if we try to say for all X in the integers, P of X, now remember, this is a proposition saying that no matter what integer we plug into P of X, we will always get a true proposition. Well, clearly we don't because we actually have this one value here that gives us a false proposition. So because of that, this whole statement here is a false proposition. So when we're working with a universal quantifier, basically this statement is true if every x in our domain A gives applied to P of x gives us a true proposition. And this whole statement is false if at least one x in our domain applied to P of x gives us a false proposition. Our next quantifier is the existential quantifier. So we're going to let P be a predicate from some non-empty set again to our Boolean space. The existential quantification of P is the statement. It is the case that P of X is true for at least one X in A. Or I could think of it as there exists one, X, one element X in our domain such that P of X is true. And we'll write it this time using a backwards E. So E X P of X really just, there exists an X such that P of X is true. Can also write it like this. E X and A P of X. And we can specify that X comes from the set A. If we want to be more careful about really specifying the domain of this predicate. So really what we're saying is that if any of these X's in our domain makes P of X true, then this whole thing, again, like with the universal quantifier, this whole thing is a proposition. So if one X in our domain makes this true, then the whole proposition is true. So for the universal quantifier, 
I referenced this example, the one that we've sort of been using for a little bit now, we showed that because we have p of zero is false, that the universal quantification of the statement is false. However, we do have that p of negative eight is true. So we have that at least one element of our domain makes p true. So in this case, for this definition of p, we can say that there exists an x in the integers such that p of x, and this whole thing is equivalent to true. But now if we look at the example, p going from, let's say, the integers to our Boolean set, like so, defined by p of x is the statement, 0 times x is not equal to 0. And we know from our previous example that when p of x is the statement 0, x equals 0, that this is true for every possible x. So what we've done is we've sort of taken the reverse of this and we say that, okay, well, 0 times x is not equal to 0. And we can pretty easily assume that, well, this is going to be false for every single x we pass into it. So in this case, there does not exist a single x in the integer such that, such that 0, x is not equal to 0. So the statement, there exists an x in the integers such that p of x is true. This whole thing is a false proposition. So the previous example actually segues really nicely into this talk of predicates being logically equivalent. So we're going to let p and q be predicates with quantifiers. We'll say that p is logically equivalent to q if, see what I did here, by the way, I'm using iff to represent if and only if, and that's a lot shorthand you'll see me use a lot in this, uh, in this whole class. So anyway, we'll say that P is logically equivalent to Q if and only if they have the same truth value. So what I'll do actually right now is give an example of two predicates, two quantified predicates that do not, that are not logically equivalent. So what we had before is that we had for all X, zero X equals zero is not logically equivalent to there exists an x such that 0x is not equal to 0. Because this is a true quantified predicate and this is a false quantified predicate. However, what we can notice is that we can say, well, this for all x, 0x equals 0 is equivalent to the negation of there exists an x such that 0x is not equal to 0. Now let's walk through why this is true. If we're saying that there exists an x such that x 0x is not equal to 0, and then we negate that whole statement, this is saying that there does not exist an x such that 0x is not equal to 0. And because there doesn't exist any x that makes this true, then all x's must do the opposite. So in other words, every x for all x's it must be true that 0x equals 0. So this is why we can actually say these are equivalent. So our boy De Morgan actually saw this kind of pattern show up, and he came up with De Morgan's laws for propositional functions. Now remember that a propositional function is just another word for a predicate. So what he discovered is that if we let p be a predicate, then we, if we take the negation of the statement for all x p of x, well, that's equivalent to saying that there exists an x such that p of x is false. Really what that means is that if it's not the case that every x makes p of x true, then there must exist at least one x such that p of x is false. In a similar vein, he realized that, well, if you take the negation of exists an x such that p of x, then that's equivalent to saying that for all x, not p of x. And this basically means that if it is not true that there exists an x that makes p of x true, then every x must make p of x false. So if we come back to this example here, we can see that saying that 0x equals 0, if this is true, then 0x is not equal to 0 will be false. So really what we've done here, if we let p of x be the statement 0x equals 0, 
This over here is going to be for all x, p of x, and this is going to be exists an x such that not p of x. And obviously, this is not going to be true. Down here, what this statement basically is, is for all x, p of x, and he's going to say that's equivalent to the negation of there exists an x such that the negation of p of x. This statement looks a little bit different than the de Morgan's laws we just figured out, so let's parse through this. This is saying that if it is true that every x satisfies p of x, then it is not true that there exists an x such that p of x is false. And if you want to show why this is equal to this, we can just apply double negation here. We'll put a not here, put another not here, and by double negation, those go away. So De Morgan's also going to be really useful here when we're talking about propositional functions. So now what I want to do is I want to give us some practice with converting sent English sentences into predicate logic. So let's take an example. Every student in this class in CSC 348 section 2 in spring quarter has taken calculus. I believe calculus 3 is actually a requirement for this class. So hopefully this is true. So what I want to do is I want to rewrite this sentence in order to make it more obvious what the sort of hidden quantified statement is. So what I'll do is I will rewrite this to say for all students in this class, they have taken calculus. Then we can take this even further. We can say for all students S, we'll name our students S in CSC 348-02-2204 S has taken calculus. Now this should look a lot more like a sentence that can be turned into a predicate. So what we can do is we can say for all S in CSC 348-02-2204 S has taken calculus. This is how we can go from some English sentence like, sentence like this into quantified logic like this. So now let's talk about what happens when you have multiple quantifiers in a predicate statement. So let's say you have something like, for all x, there exists a y such that x plus y equals 3. So what we have here is a predicate that actually needs to take in two inputs, one x and one y. And what we're saying is that we're saying one x and one y. And now what we have is we have quantified both of these variables. We need to talk, so we need to talk about what exactly is going on here. So what we're going to do is we actually want to read our multiple quantifiers left to right. So when I'm interpreting this sentence, what I'm going to say is that for any x that I choose, for every x, there exists a y such that this statement is true. Now this y isn't necessarily going to be the same for every x that we choose. In fact, it's probably going to be different given the predicate here, but that's okay. Basically what we're saying is, is that I'm, I'm claiming that I can choose any x and then for that x find a y that satisfies x plus y equals 3. So for example, if we choose x equals, I'm going to arbitrarily choose negative 103 then this claim should hold true. I should be able to find a y such that negative 103 plus y equals 3. That actually works. I can choose y equals ne uh, positive 100, so then x plus y equals 3. 
Now if I choose another example, let's say x equals 54, what I'm, what I'm still trying to claim is that I can choose any y such that x plus y equals 3. So in this case, y equals negative 51. 54 minus 51 equals 3. So this totally works. Basically, we can show that this is true by saying, well, let's choose some arbitrary x here. Then our choice for y would just be x minus 3 times negative 1. So overall, this is a true statement. So now let's look at this statement here. And reading left to right, this says, there exists a y such that for all x, x plus y equals 3. So our claim here is that there is a ultra special y such that we can choose any x and x plus y equals 3. And that's going to be a little bit more of a problem. So let's take a look at this. Let's say I choose, I try to choose y equals 0, right? And then we're going to claim that, OK, well, if y equals 0 truly is the special y that makes everything work, then every x I put in here will make x plus y equals 3 a true statement. So if we did x equals 3, well, that would be true. However, then if we do x equals 2, then we're going to run into some problems. Now, this whole statement is false. We'll get some more tools to work with why this is false. But as a very brief explanation, we can say that I'm going to choose some special y. And let's suppose that I happen to find the exact right y. Then there's going to be some value k such that y plus k equals 3. So if we choose x to be k, then this whole statement will be fine. But what we're saying is that this should be true for every x once we find our special y. So then if we then say, well, let's let x equal k minus 1, then y plus k minus 1 is then going to be 3 minus 1, which equals 2. So therefore, we have a value of x that doesn't work for the special y that we claimed it would work. So because of this, this whole statement is false. Now, what I just did here was an example of a concept that we won't see for a little bit longer. So don't worry too much about this whole process right now. I just wanted to give an example of how switching the, switching the order of our quantifiers here can dramatically change our predicate logic. So we go from this being a true statement to this being a false statement just by switching our quantifiers here. So that's it on predicates. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, hopefully you have a great rest of your day.